All right, thank you very much. Um, so that's the title. This work that I'll talk about today is based on a paper to appear uh, in collaboration with Dan Fried, Hotat Lam, and Nadi. Um, and there are many precursors. A lot of what we're doing is a, is a synthesis of old results, though there are lots of new results. But some of the more important, um, uh, more important references for our work are these. OK, so what's the big picture? So quantum systems, like quantum field theories, often come with coupling constants. And of course, we're often interested in exploring the dependence on these coupling constants. And there's kind of two complementary applications. We'll get more precise as we go along. But the first is that we might want to know the behavior of the quantum field theory as a function of the parameters. So for instance, we might want to track the Berry connection and understand uh, how the ground states are varying. Or if we're in quantum field theory, we might want to know how the infrared depends on a given parameter. And the second thing that we'll see is related is that we may want to make the parameters depend on space and time to make some kind of interface or topological defect. And then sometimes those uh, interesting objects that you make by space-time dependent couplings support some localized degrees of freedom. So we'll be studying both of these, both of these problems. And in this talk, we'll show that there are often some simple topological kind of arguments that imply that the behavior of a theory as a function of parameters is interesting. So for instance, we might find a topological argument that predicts a phase transition. Or we might uh, similarly find an argument that implies that there are necessarily local, localized degrees of freedom on these objects that we make by varying coupling constants. And we'll see that these two phenomena are related. And we'll view these kind of topological arguments as sort of generalized anomalies in the space of parameters. So that will be the language that we'll use. And I'll define that as we go along. OK, so uh, to start, let me focus on a very simple elementary example, which is a single, uh, which is a quantum particle on a circle. So we'll be in quantum mechanics. And this example actually illustrates all the features that we'll see. And we'll build up the language here, and then we'll subsequently generalize to field theory. So this is our Lagrangian. We've got a single variable q, which is 2 pi periodic. And the Lagrangian here has a standard kinetic term. And then the hero of the story is this term theta q dot. So theta is a coupling constant. Uh, and we're going to study the dependence on theta and what happens when we make uh, theta dynamical. That would be the kind of question that we're interested in. Sorry, theta, not dynamical. Theta depend on space and time. And OK, so what does the parameter theta do? Well, if you're in a path integral formula formulation, then uh, q dot, and you're on a Euclidean circle, the integral of q dot can be, some, uh, can be 2 pi times some integer. You can have a winding sector. And so theta weights how we sum over those different winding sectors in the path integral. OK, so uh, what is there to discuss? Well, this is a quadratic uh, action. So you can just solve the theory directly. These are the energies. There is a state for every integer n. And the energies are, are given by this simple <coughs> formula. And you're supposed to notice one thing about this formula, which is that if theta is not equal to pi, then there is a unique ground state. But if theta is equal to pi, then there are two degenerate ground states. So there's necessarily level crossing as we vary theta. OK, that's what you're supposed to notice. Now, uh, that's supposed to be a bit surprising. So eigenvalue repulsion tells you that if you have a one parameter family of Hamiltonians, level crossing should not typically happen. And on the other hand, we had a one parameter family of Hamiltonians labeled by theta, and we saw that there was level crossing. So uh, of course, we could just see it by writing down the formula. But the spirit of this uh, seminar is we'd like to understand a kind of more topological sort of argument for this that will be, turn out to be very robust. So we'd like to understand why this level crossing happens. OK, so one, one way to approach this is to examine the global symmetries of this problem. So what are they? So the first is that 
there is a u1 shift symmetry. So we can take the variable q and we can shift it by, uh, by chi. And um, since q is periodic, this is a u1 symmetry. There's also time reversal, which acts on q by uh, changing q of tau to minus q of minus tau. That's a symmetry of the Lagrangian. And then at two special values, theta equals 0 and theta equals pi, there is an extra symmetry C, char you can call it charge conjugation, which just flips the sign of Q. So that's a symmetry only at those special values. Now, one way to understand the, the level crossing is was provided by uh, in this paper here. And what you do is you look at the group formed by C and U1 and at, at theta equals pi and theta equals 0. So this is the group O2. Uh, but the action of this O2 is pretty interesting when you're at theta equals pi. So at theta equals pi, the states transform in a projective representation of this O2. So it means that not only is the ground state degenerate, but every energy eigenvalue is degenerate with degeneracy 2. So um, one way to think about that is that it's a kind of anomaly in quantum mechanics. So for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with anomalies in low dimensional system. In quantum mechanics, an anomaly in a global symmetry means that the states transform projectively under that global symmetry. So we have a situation where the operators are in good representations of O2, but the states are in projective representations of O2. And that's one thing that's happening here. And that the fact that uh, uh, there is this anomaly means that the ground states and in fact all energy eigenstates are degenerate. So that's one argument for this conclusion. Let me give you another argument, which is more in the spirit of what we'll talk about. So we had this U1 symmetry, which existed for all theta. So we can couple our system to a background gauge field A for the U1 symmetry. And so now we have a partition function uh, Z that depends on theta, the coupling constant, and A, the background U1 gauge field. So when A was off, we had this very simple equation. Z of theta plus 2 pi is Z of theta. And this is what made us think that theta, the coupling constant, is periodic with periodicity 2 pi. Now, once you couple to A, uh, this equation is no longer true. So if you shift theta by 2 pi, you don't quite get back to yourself. Instead, you pick up this additional, uh, this additional Wilson line this additional integral uh, 1D uh, turn Simon's term. And so the theory at theta uh, and theta plus 2 pi are not exactly the same when we couple to background fields. Uh, they differ by a local counter term. So the, the important point here is that the difference between the theory at theta plus 2 pi and theta is a function only of this classical background A. Any questions? So the fact that theta and theta plus 2 pi differ by a local counter term is a manifestation of the level crossing. And one way to understand this is that um, as you dial theta to, uh, through 2 pi, the entire energy spectrum comes back to itself, but the individual states get rearranged. So the U1 charge of the ground state changes when we shift theta to theta plus 2 pi. And that's exactly what this, this kind of formula is telling us. So this, if we introduce A, we're, and compute the partition function, we're counting states according to their u1 charge. And so this is telling us that the charges are transforming when we shift theta to theta plus 2 pi. OK, so what should we think about the periodicity of theta? So originally theta was 2 pi periodic, but now we have this new equation, which suggests that there's some subtlety in the 2 pi periodicity. And you can ask, what should you do if you really want to keep theta exactly 2 pi periodic. And one way to do it in the spirit of anomalies is that we can extend, uh, we have our quantum mechanics uh, world, world line, and we pick some two-manifold y. Uh, y has as boundary this 1D quantum mechanics system. And we extend theta and the U1 gauge field A into the bulk y. 
And now I can define a new partition function. Let me call it tilde z. So tilde z has the old partition function, c of theta a, and then it has this classical term, this integral over y. This integral over y has, uh, it depends only on theta and a, that's why I called it a classical term, but not on the dynamical field q. So all the dynamics is still happening in quantum mechanics in the one dimension, but we have some classical term here. So once we define this new partition function, the advantage that we have is that, is that now theta is exactly 2 pi periodic, even in the presence of this u1 gauge field A. But of course, the price we've paid is that now the, uh, the, act, the partition function depends on uh, this extension of the classical fields into y. Questions about this? OK. So this result um, is uh, very similar to phenomenon typically referred to as anomalies. So we had a, a 2D bulk action. And like I stressed before, it depends only on the classical fields and not on the dynamical degree of freedom Q. And if you look at this 2D classical action on a closed two-manifold, it's some well-defined phase that you get that depends on theta and, and A. And on a boundary, uh, on a manifold with boundary, it's not. And it compensates for the failed 2 pi periodicity of theta. Okay, so what, what's the novelty? The real novelty is, is simply that usually when you discuss anomalies, you're thinking about background fields only for global symmetries. So A was a background field for a global symmetry, so we don't, we're not surprised to find it sitting in this classical action. But here, something interesting has happened, which is that theta has also been extended into the bulk and is, is participating in this classical action. Okay, so that's, we can view this as a kind of generalized anomaly involving theta uh, and A, the coupling constant and the gauge field. And we'll see that all of our examples are sort of similar to this. We have a kind of generalization of the notion of anomalies that involves coupling to classical uh, extensions of the, of the coupling constants into the bulk. Any questions about the quantum mechanics example? That's right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you, you kind of have, a, you sort of have your option, which is that you can either live with this, this, uh, this sort of failed periodicity of theta, or you can extend it into the bulk, and then it's exactly periodic in theta, but it depends on the extension. And that's similar to all anomalies. When you, cla when you cancel them by inflow, um, they remain, gauge, you restore gauge invariance, but now you depend on the extension. Th this 1D term? Yeah, this is just a, a, you could think of it as a 1D term Simon's term. So it's well defined provided the coefficient in front of the integral of IA is an integer. Yeah. Yeah, good. So, so here in this uh, analysis, this singled out theta equals pi as being a special place. Um, the argument that I gave you will not single out theta equals pi as being a special place. And that will be both good and bad, as we'll see. The a priori from this argument, you don't know anything. In fact, let me, let me come back to this. Um, what is happening here? OK, so, okay, so this, new, uh, this new anomaly, uh, as was anticipated here, gives another argument for level crossing, which is similar to standard ideas of anomaly matching. So imagine you shift theta by 2 pi. So uh, the bulk classical term has a non-zero boundary contribution. And we know that the whole partition function, this thing I called z tilde, which has the boundary quantum mechanics and the classical bulk, is invariant under the shift by theta goes to theta plus 2 pi. And so that means that um, the, uh, the ground states must have level crossing. So a single isolated ground state for all theta does not produce this shift that you see from, from the bulk. So implicit in this reasoning is, is uh, kind of standard ideas of anomaly matching, which is that 
the uh, anomaly, this classical action in this case that we're writing, is invariant under RG flow. So it's a property only of the ground states. And this is true because this, uh, this anomaly has a kind of non-trivial cohomology class. So it's a, it's a rigid object. Yeah, the coefficient is quantized here, exactly. So this uh, theta dA term with i over 2 pi, that could have been an integer there, but, um, but nothing continuous. OK, so now let's, uh, what, what's good about this, this argument? After all, we already knew that level crossing occurred. Um, we already even knew that it occurred at theta equals pi. We had the exact spectrum. One thing that's good about the argument is that it's, it's very robust. So uh, we can consider a new theory where, in addition to the variable q, let's also add a real degree of freedom x. And now I'll make the Lagrangian interacting with q and x. So first of all, I'll add a cosine potential for q. So that breaks the u1 symmetry to zn. Uh, I'll also add a generic potential for x and couple x to q through this term. So now uh, the additional t and c symmetries are also gone. And of course, we don't know the spectrum of this theory. But the, uh, the anomaly that I discussed in terms of theta survives. And it again implies that level crossing must occur at some value theta star between 0 and 2 pi. So now, uh, since there's no special value of theta star where there's any enhanced symmetry, we can't tell you where that theta star is. And in fact, by fiddling with the interactions here, you can, you can move that theta star around. But we know, where, we know that there is at least one level crossing somewhere. Why did I need x? Well, I, so for instance, if I remove x and just have the cosine, then there'll still be some additional discrete symmetry at a special value of theta. And I could pin down theta equals pi. The point of this example was to show you that, um, that I could have a more generic example that has this anomaly. And you still learn that there's level crossing. Sorry, you mean more generic than cosine? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, so it's important in order for the argument to, to work that there's a still a Zn symmetry. Um, if, there's, if you remove the Zn symmetry by writing something completely generic, then the argument won't work. And in fact, there is no in general level crossing. Yes, you, you generalize the argument by taking A to be a Zn gauge field. And then when you shift theta by 2 pi, you pick up a Zn Wilson line. It's theta box sign of the Zn gauge field. Mm. If you want to make it more clear, you can integrate it by parts and write d theta over 2 pi in time and reduce that mod n, and then multiply it by the Zn gauge field. The more physical way you mean in terms of the fact that the ground states shift in charge, yeah. So, um, right, the, uh, uh, since, so this formula here meant that the, um, the ground state shifts its u1 charge as we vary theta to theta plus 2 pi. And the same thing happens with the zn charge in the case where we broke into zn. OK, so, so we, yeah. Well, whenever you cancel anomalies by inflow, you extend the classical fields into one higher dimension. And then uh, you restore gauge invariance. But the, ant the partition function depends on how you extended the classical fields into one higher dimension. So here it's the same. Yeah. 
No, let me make it, let me in fact take it to be not even so that there's no additional symmetry. So the, the, the point of this example is to show that that was not necessary. Okay. So um, as long as you have the Zn symmetry, no other discrete symmetries are needed. More questions? OK, so uh, we've seen uh, quantum mechanics example. And now I'm going to do an elementary uh, field theory example. And then we'll get into some more some more interesting interacting field theory considerations. So what's the simplest, uh, a good simple f uh, field theory example is a 4D vial fermion. So again, uh, this example is exactly solvable. Uh, we don't need this fancy language, but it will be, uh, we'll build up the language here and then we can generalize it to other uh, more interesting situations. Okay, so we're gonna study this theory now as a function of its complex mass parameter M. And let's focus on the region of large mass m. So here there's a large energy gap above the ground state. And uh, one would say that the long distance theory is trivially gapped. So by that I mean it's gapped and there are no topological degrees of freedom. And so one consequence of, uh, of this is that you could think of the partition function as a function of mass. It's independent of the argument of the mass. So the partition function obeys this equation. Uh, how should you think about this? Well, one useful way for our analysis to think about it is that effectively the space of masses is like a two-sphere because uh, at large absolute value of m, the, uh, the partition function is independent of the phase of m. And so we could add a point uh, where the mass is infinity and think of it as a two-sphere effectively. Okay, so now uh, that was all sort of in, in correlation functions in flat space. Let's discover what happens when we put the theory on a curved manifold with metric G. So now the theory is not quite independent of the argument of M. And instead, when you try to change the argument of M, you introduce a gravitational counter term. So trace R wedge R, where R is the curvature. So you have this equation here. So when you shift the argument of m by e to the i phi, you pick up a gravitational theta angle uh, with coefficient phi here. And so this, just as in our quantum mechanics example, this signals some kind of an anomaly. So in the presence of a background metric, the behavior at large absolute value of m depends on the argument of m. Okay. So, uh, just like in the quantum mechanics example, we can now try to restore the independence of the partition function on arg m by coupling to some classical 5D bulk. So we're going to extend, uh, so we have a, a five manifold y, and the boundary of y is the physical space time. And we're going to extend all the classical fields into the bulk. So we extend the metric into y, and we extend the mass into y. And we define a new partition function which uh, the, the dynamical degrees of freedom are all the same as before. So all the dynamics is in the four dimensions. But now there's this extra classical contribution. It depends on, on the mass. And here lambda of m is some one form with this property. And now this combined system, this 4D dynamics coupled to 5D classical bulk, has the feature that it's again independent of the argument of m. But the price we paid is that we extended everything, class, uh, all the classical fields into the bulk. So again, this is similar to standard, uh, standard techniques and anomalies. The novelty here is that the mass is making a direct appearance. So we've extended the mass into the bulk. OK. So that looked very fancy. What kind of conclusions can we draw from this analysis? So one thing we can do is we can apply anomaly matching again. And anomaly matching in this case would mean that the long distance theory cannot be trivially gapped everywhere in the space of masses. So, okay, for the free fermion, this is completely obvious. Of course, when the mass is zero, 
you have a massless fermion, and that's not trivially gapped. But the point of the analysis, just like the quantum mechanics example, is that the conclusion is robust under lots of deformations. So for instance, we could couple the theory to a scalar field. Here's an example. So I've added phi, some potential, and some coupling between phi and the fermions. And now there's, um, there's no global symmetry, and m equals 0 is not special anymore. But the same anomaly uh, exists, and it implies that somewhere in the complex m plane, the IR is non-trivial. But where is not singled out by this kind of analysis? Any? It does not necessarily mean continuous degree of freedom. So the only conclusion that you get from this is that it cannot be trivially gapped. So there could be a, a TQFT somewhere. Okay, so let's discuss another kind of uh, a, another kind of application of this reasoning. So we can uh, consider masses that depend on space and time, and I advertise that there are sometimes interesting localized degrees of freedom that you get. And so we'll see that in this example. So let's take the mass m to depend on coordinates in a plane. And we're going to try and make a string so that the coordinates that will depend on are x and y. And we'll try and make a string along the z direction by having some varying profile of the mass. Yeah? No, this is a 4D field theory in the bulk. So this is a 4D field theory. So we have a 5-manifold whose boundary is this 4D field theory. And m is now some allowed to be some space-time space dependent function that depends on, uh, on this 5-manifold uh, and restricts to our given mass at the boundary. More questions? OK, so let's consider this, uh, this example where m is depending on x and y. And we're going to try and make a string along the z direction. So let's take a uh, situation where m winds n times around infinity. So concretely, uh, using coordinates r and phi in the plane, we could take m is like r e to the i n phi, that kind of profile for the mass. So in this case, uh, the string world volume along the z direction is gapless. And it has this chiral central charge. C left minus C right is n over 2, where n is this n here. And for a free fermion, this is a well-known result. And uh, in particular, since it's a free fermion, you can just solve the Dirac equation in the background of this uh, position-dependent mass. And then trapped on the string, you find n Meyer on a vial 0 modes. And that's what gives rise to this formula. OK, we can rederive this uh, uh, in a kind of highbrow way using our anomaly action that we had before. So let me take this, this bulk term and rewrite it in this way. So all I did is move a derivative d here from one term to the other. So now CS grav is the gravitational turn Simon's term. And uh, this is some two form in the mass space. And now we're in a situation where the mass is winding around. And so I can use this to do inflow. And I can integrate this mass dependence here. And that gives me an uh, anomaly action for the string that becomes this, e to the i n times the gravitational turn Simon's term. Now this kind of term always implies that the world volume theory, this is an anomaly inflow term for, three, for a 2D theory, and it implies that the world volume has c left minus c right is n over 2. So here's how we reproduce this conclusion using our anomaly in the space of parameters. And so just like before, uh, where we saw that our argument was, was robust, here also the conclusion about the chiral central charge on the string is robust. The exact degrees of freedom that make it up depend on the model you might consider. So the fact that it was free fair free fermions might be particular to the free fermion example. Um, and in, more inter in an interacting 4D example with the same anomaly, the boundary, the string world volume could be interacting as well. Yeah. 
This is a five manifold with boundary. No, th the whole point is that the, the string is now the boundary of this 3D term. So this is, a, this, is, this is now integrated on a three manifold with boundary, and the boundary is the string world volume. So I've used this bulk anomaly of the big theory to get the world volume anomaly of, um, of the string that I made by space-time space dependent masses. More questions? Okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, so the boundary of this five manifold is our, is our four manifold, and the masses are varying in our four manifold, and the metric is, is not, so, well, the, the metric is what it is, so, so then we're integrating this, this two form, which is some two form in the masses. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's some, it has some total integral one because, or total int integral n based on the mass param variation that I chose. More questions? Okay, so uh, we've seen a couple examples. Let me try and tell you what our working understanding of the general paradigm is. So what's our working way of, of detecting an anomaly in the space of parameters? So to start, you take the local operators in your quantum field theory and you look at their correlation functions at separated points. And these depend on some coupling constants like theta m, theta and m and so forth. That, and these make up the parameter space that we're interested in. And then when we examine contact terms of these correlation functions so, or look at topologically non-trivial backgrounds for global symmetries, the parameter identifications might change. So, Theta is, might no longer be 2 pi periodic exactly. We saw that in the quantum mechanics example. And then we try and interpret this as an anomaly in the space of parameters. And we try and couple the system in d dimensions to a classical d plus 1 dimensional field theory to restore the original parameter space identifications. That's one way to think about concretely what we did. And this classical field theory will depend on the parameters by fiat and per perhaps other background fields for global symmetries, like we saw the U1 gauge field in the quantum mechanics example, and we saw the metric in the 4D fermion example. And this is, gives us our, our way of identifying anomalies in the space of parameters. Okay, once you have this expression, this uh, D plus one dimensional classical action, it has concretely two kinds of applications that we've seen now. So the first is that it always implies that the IR behavior cannot be trivially gapped everywhere in parameter space. So this is a uh, standard implication of anomaly matching, but now using this, uh, this parameter anomaly. And the second thing is that using these kind of integration by parts tricks and, and inflow tricks, we can compute the world volume anomaly on a defect that we make by space-time dependent parameters. So we see that this same mathematical formalism unifies these two kind of different applications. Okay, so let me, let me say what I just said in a different way. So in some simple cases, our, can, our idea can reduce to the following logic. So imagine you have a trivially gapped quantum field theory in D space-time dimensions. So how, how should we think about it? Well, it's characterized at low energies by some classical action that depends only on the background fields. So if you have some UV theory, it depends on, we make a partition function ZUV that depends on sources AI. And if the theory is trivially gapped, then at long distances, all the, um, the partition function will flow to some local function of the sources. So what am I saying uh, in more normal language? What I'm saying is that the correlation function at separated points are all zero. There's only contact terms, and those contact terms are encoded in this F here. Okay, that's what I said here. 
Now, this low energy uh, action, or this low energy SPT in a more condensed matter language is generally unphysical because you can adjust your UV scheme, whatever it was, to absorb these counter terms. So I could, I could redefine my UV theory by just moving this to the other side, and then I'll flow to exactly one. So typically, we're not so interested in this precise uh, F that we get here. But now suppose instead you have a family of theories that depends on a parameter. Then we'll see that these Fs can come to life because we can compare the low energy Fs that we get at different values of the parameter. And if this difference is not zero and it can't be absorbed by making our scheme depend on the parameters, then there is an anomaly in the space of parameters. That's one thing we've been saying. So what it means is that in this case, somewhere in the parameter space, the IR must be non-zero. So the counter terms that you find at low energies can jump discontinuously. The, the IR must be non-trivial. OK, so the fact that uh, a jump in an SPT requires a phase transition is, is a very common notion in condensed matter physics. And this is a way of phrasing it in terms of anomalies. OK, let me revisit the examples that we had earlier in this, in this language. So let's go back to the particle in the circle. So we're examining the theory as a function of theta. Here's theta. Here's 0 and 2 pi. And what we saw is that the theory, uh, if we say that at the theory at 0 has a trivial SPT, a trivial, uh, trivial dependence on the background gauge fields, then at 2 pi, you'll pick up this non-trivial dependence on the background gauge fields. So you can't absorb this difference between 0 and uh, and this Wilson line by making a theta dependent counter term because if you try this term you could try by adding this term with continuous k but this term is only gauge invariant for integer k so we can't absorb this difference between the trivial SPT and this one by making our scheme theta dependent and that means necessarily somewhere in the theta space something interesting has to happen so that we can have this discontinuous jump OK, we can similarly look at the, the free fermion again. So in this case, we could try to remove the dependence on the argument of m by using a pure gravitational counter term. So I could add, add to the Lagrangian this kind of term, theta, uh, some theta g there. And I could try to make theta g depend on the mass. Um, so I'll promote it to be a function of the mass to remove this feature that I saw, that in the presence of a background metric, the partition function depends on the phase of the mass. And now it turns out that you can't do this for all complex M because there's just no periodic function that approaches argm for large M and is well defined over the whole complex mass plane. So there's no way to remove this dependence. And this obstruction is our anomaly. It means that there has to be some singularity in the M plane to account for this behavior. Any questions? OK, so in the last part of the talk, I'm going to go over a couple more interacting examples where we'll apply this logic and see what kind of conclusions we can draw. So let me uh, discuss a sequence of 2D examples. So we'll consider 2D U1 gauge theory with uh, NF scalar fields of charge 1. And I'll take this Lagrangian. Here, V is some potential. And if uh, V is chosen appropriately, this leads to a CPN minus 1 sigma model at low energies. But I don't need to assume that I choose V appropriately. Uh, this theory, of course, has a theta angle. And the correlation functions of local operators at separated points are periodic functions of theta um, with this identification. Theta goes to theta plus 2 pi. So we're in the sort of situation that we were in in the quantum mechanics example. And of course, our goal is to understand the physics as a function of theta and explore what happens when you make theta depend on position. OK, this model that I just introduced has a global symmetry PSUNF, which is SUNF modulo the center ZNF. And this quotient is important 
the fact that uh, it's really PSUNF and not SUNF. So let me explain that a little bit. The point is that naively you may say there's a SUNF symmetry that rotates the NF scalars phi i. But the center of SUNF acts on phi i by, uh, on, on all the phi i by a uniform phase. And this is part of the U1 gauge group. So it means that all gauge invariant operators are neutral under ZNF, which is why we get this global symmetry in PSUNF. From our point of view, PSUNF and SUNF are, are crucially different because they differ in the allowed set of background fields that you can turn on. So uh, every SUNF gauge field is a PSUNF gauge field, but the converse is not true. So the difference between PSUNF and SUNF gauge fields is encoded in what's sometimes called the second Stiefel-Whitney class, which is some element of H2 of space-time with coefficients in ZNF, the center. So um, when this, this cohomology class is zero, you have an SUNF gauge field. And when it's non-zero, you're talking about a PSUNF gauge field. And if you're not familiar with this general case for general NF, you're probably familiar with the case of SU2 versus SO3, which comes up in the discussion of spinners. So we'll see that something interesting happens when we turn on uh, backgrounds with non-trivial W2. That means backgrounds which uh, are gauge fields for PSUNF but not SUNF. So what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is that there's an interesting uh, difference in the fluxes. So because of the correlation with, uh, of the center of SUNF and the U1 gauge group, here I'll call the dynamical gauge field A, we have these, uh, this interesting quantization condition, which is that the integral of dA over 2 pi, if W2 is 0, is just an integer. That's a standard quantization. But if W2 is non-zero, we have this fractional quantization here. So more plainly, what it means is that in these backgrounds where W2 is non-zero, the instanton number, which was computed by this integral, becomes fractional. But its fraction is controlled by this background field, W2. Okay. Now the theta term in the Lagrangian is this, I theta dA over 2 pi. So if I turn on a background with non-trivial W2, the 2 pi periodicity of theta is broken. So when W2 was 0, integral of dA over 2 pi was an integer, and theta was periodic with period 2 pi. Now when W2 is non-zero, theta is no longer 2 pi periodic. So but as I stressed here, since the fractional part is determined by this classical background W2, it means I can restore the periodicity by coupling to a 3D bulk with this kind of action. Any questions about this? OK, so this is very similar to the quantum mechanics example. We've uh, extended the PSUNF gauge field to the bulk. We extended theta to the bulk, and we coupled to this bulk term and restored the 2 pi periodicity. OK, so um, we can now apply the fact that we have this, uh, this bulk action. So what can we conclude? So one thing we can conclude is that there's a phase transition at some theta star in 0, 2 pi. Of course, this agrees with common law in special cases. So um, if you look at uh, generic theta, well, let's tune the potential so, such that we're in the CPN model. And let's look at generic theta. Then the theory is trivially gapped. But at theta equals, two, theta equals pi, something special usually happens. So for CP1, this theory is believed to flow to the SU2 level 1 WZW model, which of course is not trivially gapped. And for theta equals uh, pi for n larger than 1, this example spontaneously breaks the charge conjugation and so has a first order transition. So that's consistent with our conclusions that we found, that there has to be a phase transition somewhere. But um, our conclusions apply for more general potentials and also when theta equals pi is not a general, is not a special point. So when we break some more symmetry, we can use the same kind of argument.
Okay, the second kind of application is to consider position dependent theta. So let's look at an interface where uh, on one where theta depends on x, and in one limit theta is taken to be zero, in the other limit theta is taken to be two pi, and there's a smooth interpolation between them. So we can integrate our anomaly action to find the effective uh, anomaly of this quantum mechanics that lives here. So like I said, the, the theory is generically gapped for, gener for, is trivially gapped for generic theta. So we can isolate some effective quantum mechanics uh, at low energies in this situation. And we could try and compute what its anomaly is. We do that by integrating the anomaly action. And we find this term. So what does it mean? This is an anomaly for quantum mechanics. It means that the effective quantum mechanics states that we found are in a projective representation of the global symmetry. So in this case, we're discussing PSUNF global symmetry. So a projective representation means a representation of SUNF. So you could think intuitively that the degrees of freedom here are like the scalar fields that were in the Lagrangian to start with. But since it's strongly interacting, um, that picture is at best intuitive. But they have the same, they have the same sort of NFality as those. Any questions? Okay. Okay. For my last example, yeah. The length scale. I'm assuming it's very smooth. Yes. So I take the 2D theory with its. I think it's 2D theory, and I plug in uh, wherever I see theta. I write theta of x, where theta of x is a very is a smooth function with variation that's longer in scale than any other scale in the problem. Okay, for the last example, um, I'll consider 4D SUN Yang Mills. Okay, everybody should know the Lagrangian. Here it is. Um, and again, it has a, a theta term. And for any SUN gauge field, this, this instanton number is quantized. And so the correlation functions of local operators at separated points are periodic functions of theta with 2 pi periodicity. And our goal is to understand what kind of subtleties exist in that periodicity, and therefore to understand the theory as a function of theta, and to constrain the world volume dynamics of interfaces when theta varies. So same kind of goals, same kind of logic, but the, exam the uh, techniques will be a little more subtle because the gauge theory is getting more complicated. So this theory has a slightly unfamiliar s global symmetry, which I'll now describe, which is a ZN one-form global symmetry in the terminology introduced in this paper. Let me just remind you a little bit about what that means. So to say that the symmetry is a one-form symmetry means that the charged objects are line operators, in this case Wilson lines, not local operators. And the charge of a Wilson line is its anality, so its charge under the center of SUN. And that's a good quantum number because we're considering pure gauge theory, so the only dynamical fields are adjoints, and uh, they therefore cannot screen this anality. So I remind you that the anality, if you have a young tableau, is the number of boxes mod n. And since the, well, OK. So the behavior of this symmetry at long distances tells us about confinement. So it gives you one way to say what confinement means in terms of symmetries. Uh, in a confining phase, the symmetry is preserved. In a deconfined phase, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. That's this one form symmetry. And in order to apply our previous logic, we'd like to understand the appropriate notion of background fields for this one form symmetry. And in a kind of older language, these are the Tuft twisted boundary conditions. So in, in modern language, it means that you can couple the theory to a discrete background two form gauge field B. So B lives here. So M is space time. And when B is on, what does it mean? The dynamical fields that we're summing over become PSUN gauge fields, but they have W2 equal to this B, which is fixed and not summed over. 
that's what it means to say that we turn on a background gauge field for this global symmetry. OK, just like the QED example in two dimensions, the key effect here is that when you turn on this background field or when you're in these Toef twisted boundary conditions, the instanton number is fractional. And there's this formula for computing the, the fraction. So if b is 0, then you have the standard fact that the instanton number is some integer m. When b is non-zero, there's an expression that's roughly b squared, but in a, uh, precisely is this uh, thing called the Pontryagin square that tells you what the fractional part of the instanton number is. So the important point is that uh, the fractional part is determined by this background b. So that will be the key. And this, of course, means that in these topologically non-trivial backgrounds, the periodicity of theta is modified. So because the instanton number fractionalized, something interesting happens. OK, so we can now restore the periodicity of theta by coupling to a, a 5D SBT with the following kind of bulk action. So we extend theta and B into the bulk. And we have this, uh, this classical expression. And if we combine this classical field theory with the Yang-Mills theory on the boundary, the theory becomes exactly 2 pi periodic in theta again. But now, of course, we've extended our fields into the bulk. And so one thing that we conclude is that uh, Yang-Mills theory as a function in th of theta must have a phase transition. And this agrees with common lore. So um, for in if you start at theta equals 0, we have some evidence that the theory is confining and trivially gapped. And now we could try increasing theta and try to understand what happens. And what's believed to happen is that at theta equals pi, the theory spontaneously breaks time reversal symmetry T. So there's two vacua there, and there's a first order transition. So all you learn from my argument is that there has to be, it, it, it has to be non, there has to be something not trivially gapped at some theta. That's all you learn from my argument. But um, more sophisticated, more detailed arguments sometimes show more. So for instance, um, that's what I was uh, about, about to say here. So, um, so first of all, let's discuss this time reversal symmetry T. So uh, this is a symmetry only at theta equals 0 and theta equals pi. And for even n at theta equals pi, you can prove that the infrared there is, um, is not trivially gapped by exhibiting a time reversal anomaly. So that was done here. And uh, in a sense, what the argument that I've given here shows is that, um, first of all, it's also true for odd n. There was a, there was a pre-existing argument for odd n, but it was much more cumbersome. Um, and our analysis also generalizes and shows that this kind of thing is robust under t-violating de t -violating deformation. So that might be interesting in an example with matter with some potential, for instance. It could be gapless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gapless is fine. So the only thing that this kind of argument shows is that it's not trivially gapped everywhere in theta. OK, more questions about this? OK, we can also, yeah. Well, that was, that's one kind of example that is, for instance, in the quantum mechanics example. But one of the interesting points of the fer free fermion example was that it was not like that. So in, in, that case, in, in that case, it's qualitatively different. So it's not that the SPT changes discontinuously in a one-parameter family, but rather there's a kind of obstruction that's characteristic of a two-parameter family. Right? So, so there it was really essential that we were talking about complex masses. OK, the final thing I want to say is we can consider, again, a position-dependent theta, where along some x, in one direction asymptotically it goes to 0, and the other direction asymptotically it goes to 2 pi times an integer. And 
we can integrate our anomaly action to find the anomaly of the low energy effective 3D QFT, which we'll get by reducing in this configuration. And we get this expression. And this, uh, for instance, means that, the first of all, the low energy 3D QFT cannot be trivial. It has some, some anomaly, so there's something living there. And then you can discuss what kind of degrees of freedom can, can live there. And one possibility is SUN level K turn Simon's theory living on this wall. And this agrees with recent, early, uh, recent work on this subject. OK, so I'm done. Let me just conclude and say that there are some examples that are interesting that I didn't discuss. For instance, there are phase transitions in, uh, uh, in QCD, provided the number of flavors and number of colors are not co-prime. And there are interesting uh, strings in 4D QCD with non-trivial anomalies, similar, similar to the uh, 4D fermion example. And hopefully there are many more examples that I haven't yet thought of. Thanks very much.